All right. So let's open our books. We're going to go into unearned income. Okay. So obviously we've gone from earned income. We talked about it. We stressed that that earned income because when we get into our next chapter that we're going to do after this one, that's where we're going to delve into the earned income credit. Okay. So chapter four, unearned income. It says there that we addressed unearned, uh, excuse me, addressed earned income the last chapter. And this one does the concept of unearned income. And it's thought of as passive income. What would that mean? I'm really not doing anything to receive it. Okay. It's just coming to me. All right. Okay. Um, it talks about examples like interest, dividends, alimony, unemployment compensation, gambling winnings, contrary to those people that think sitting in front of a slot machine for eight hours a day is work, okay? All right, that is passive income, all right? Um, later, we'll talk a little bit more about under an income with the retirement, rentals, and royalties. Um, they go, those get to, we need to get a little bit more specific with details on all of those. So we'll talk about those later because they have kind of their own little spot to, and forms that we have to use. All right. As the objectives say, we're going to recognize unearned income because obviously you have to have that to be able to explain to somebody why they don't get the earned income credit when everything is unearned. Um, we're going to talk about interest and dividends. Uh, we're going to introduce the 1099. Okay. That's a form that we're going to use a lot for unearned income um, and some earned income. Um, it's a document that's kind of the brother of the W-2 um, that shows income in a bunch of different perspectives. We'll talk about the Schedule B. We'll talk about penalties on early withdrawals. Uh, we're going to talk about handling of the state tax refund. Uh, we're going to determine uh, about alimony paid and what is taxable alimony. Uh, Schedule K-1. Okay, anybody know what a K-1 is or ever seen one? No? Okay. Um, K-1s, we'll talk about them. Basically, they're a W-2 for business like an S-Corp if you receive a portion of that. Or if you're a beneficiary of an estate, you'll get a K-1. It's kind of like a W-2 for those types of income. All right. Uh, we'll talk about them. There's, I think there's 72 or 75 lines boxes and stuff, you know, on a K-1, most of the time you'll deal with about four or five of them. Pretty simple to do as far as getting in there. Um, they're generated, but if you ever end up doing a partnership or a um, an estate or an S-Corp return, so each one of the stockholders would get a K-1, right? Sometimes people get K-1s if their retirement or investment accounts are part owners of an oil well or something like that. They'll get it because they're getting their share of the profits, and that's what the K-1 is, as opposed to a dividend, okay? So don't get too caught up on what a K-1 is, all right? Um, we'll talk about reporting unemployment, uh, miscellaneous income. Obviously, if we don't have anything, we gotta have a spot to put everything that we can't figure out a spot for. Uh, determine how to report gambling winnings, all right? Do you have any gamblers in here? Anybody that's gonna admit that they're a gambler? Okay. Um, we're going to determine what income goes on line 21. That's where our other income is. Okay. So interest and dividends. Uh, talks about the pub 17. Um, obviously interest is money received for money loaned or deposited to an account. Right now, interest is not much. So when you see the little line that says form 1099 INT is required to be filed by the payer, if earnings are $10 or more, all right? When you're earning less than 1% on your money, it takes a long time to get to $10, okay? Depending on how much your savings is, all right? Um, right now, with interest rates being so low, we don't see a lot because you'll ask somebody, well, I see in the past that your M&T bank account, you had X number of dollars or you had interest income. And so, you know, I didn't get anything this year. Well, it was less than $10. What we see quite a bit of is uh, escrow accounts, interest on the escrow. So if you have a mortgage and your property tax comes out of the payment 
and your homeowner's insurance or whatever else, that money that's sitting in there is earning interest. That's where we'll see a lot more interest statements right now. Okay, But we'll talk about all the different interest statements that we have. All right. So if it's less than 10, it won't be reported. All right. And then we'll talk about the difference between taxable and tax exempt because they both must be put on the return. Otherwise, you'll get a love letter from the IRS saying, hey, I see you had interest income. Here's a bill, here's interest. So if you don't distinguish it, they may think that you're avoiding paying tax on income. So we have to distinguish that. Talks about types of interest. We talked about banks, uh, savings bonds. You know, if you have double E savings bonds, those have interest on them. Uh, savings bonds for education, uh, treasury notes, uh, sometimes, you know, if you have uh, through your life insurance, a whole life thing, there may be a component of it that may have some annuities or something like that, that you would receive interest. Uh, we'll talk about original issue discount and loans made to others. Okay. What that may mean is if you sell your house and you decide who you sell it to, that you're going to hold the mortgage. So you're the mortgage company basically. Okay. Well, you're charging interest on that loan to them and they're making the payment. Part of that is interest and part of the principal. That interest they pay to you, you have to declare as income. Okay. Um, when I was out in Akron, I used to see this quite a bit because uh, the on the reservation, nobody can own property. So people off the reservation that were not part of the reservation would own the property and uh, hold the mortgages for the homes on there. It's kind of an interesting thing. So I've never seen that before, but it was kind of strange because they can't own land. So they, a lot of it was uh, people held private mortgages for the mobile homes or modular homes or whatever that were on there that weren't actually part of the land. So wasn't there to negotiate that treaty. So I don't understand all that one. Okay. Um, on four or five, you see, that we have uh, a discussion about the interest statement, the 1099 INT. Uh, there's some boxes on there. It kind of shows you that, you know, your interest will go to the taxable interest line. And then if you have uh, federal income tax withheld, that will go into our payments area, okay? There's a little help box down at the bottom. It says U.S. Treasury obligations, including U.S. savings bonds and U.S. Treasury bills, notes, and bonds are exempt from state and local income taxes, okay? So we'll, we'll see how to handle it within the um, TaxWise software, but just remember that, you know, there's a great table on page, the next page on 4.6, where it shows, you know, when you see the interest, is it taxable on the federal and is it taxable on the state, okay? Great table, great reference to have, because sometimes investments, when people have portfolios, they may have within there that some uh, their investments are buying municipal bonds or for a school district or something like that. And uh, we have to decide whether that interest that they make off those municipal bonds is taxable or not. Okay. As you can see, municipal bonds, not taxable on the federal, but taxable on the state. However, there's an asterisk, so I cannot make that generalization because what does it say? As a general rule, in most states, bonds issued by a state are exempt from that state's income tax. So what's that saying? We have to check, okay? All right, there's a key word in there, in most states. All right, okay. Now, interest statements, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit about tax-wise here, okay? So, I'm going to kind of put this in here with it. So, if you want to open a return that you have, go to page one of your 1040 and go where we'll see if we're going to work on the lines 8A and 8B where it talks about interest, okay? Because this is a great way to kind of talk about the interest too. So, let me know if everybody's, everybody's program working okay. D 
you with uh, looks like the main thing is that there's a couple little like one of those uh, update packs or whatever they call them for Windows okay. that may have been the thing. So it's putting those in right now. Okay. So it may that may have been what caught it because it was looking for something it needed to run the program in the background. So it's installing those right now. Okay. All right. So everybody there? Okay. So again, everything we do is driven off to 1040. Okay. So we're looking at 8A and 8B where it's talking about taxable interest and interest, okay? Um, if you go to your line 8A, click on the little box, and then again, we're going to use our little link, and it's going to open a window, okay? It has our Schedule B, all right? So here's going to be my first... Contrary statement of the day. All interest goes on a Schedule B, but we do not put it on a Schedule B. Okay, so as everybody freezes and thinks about that, Tim's going, hmm, I took a logic class in college and that doesn't make any sense, okay? All interest will go on a Schedule B, but we will put no interest on our Schedule B. Okay, and I want you to remember that and I'll show you just a sec. Go to your little plus sign, flaps all your little values on the tree. So I clicked on that number at 1040, click one. I'm going to go down to the line eight. And then we're going to open that guy. Okay? All right. So you can see that there's a Schedule B there. I want you to know that all interest goes on a Schedule B. That is your knowledge as a tax, pay, or tax preparer. As an employee of EG Tax, none of the interest goes on the Schedule B. Okay? So, click on your Schedule B. All right. If you take a look uh, from the things that are there on page 4H, you see that nice little interest and dividend statements, Schedule B, that's what we're going to be talking about for interest and dividends. As I said, that's where it's going to go. That's where you learn to write it when you do the handwritten exercises in the book. But as an EG tax employee, you will put no interest on those. Okay? What you will do is click in the little box under interest, little B. All right? Okay? And you're going to get your little gray link box. You're going to click on that. And you're going to get your interest statement. Okay? This is where your interest goes as an employee of EG Tax. Okay? Everything will eventually flow there. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is where you want to do it. Okay? And the reason being is if I take a look at that and I look at my little 1099B on page 4-5, Okay, or excuse my, my 1099 interest on uh, that page. Okay, I'm still on my Schedule B. It says it up in the corner, but this is where we're going to put it. And what do these little columns look like? Everything that's on my 1099 interest. Okay, so this is where we're going to put it. The reason I say this, remember I talked about the fact that sometimes when you do something tax wise, you're going to regret it. If you put things on a Schedule B and then you have to go back and try to change things, you'll regret it, okay? And sometimes when you type it on there, if you don't type it, if you type it on a Schedule B incorrectly, it won't go to the 1040 like it needs to. And I see this, and the reason I'm stressing this is because I see this mistake from at least four or five people on uh, the midterm when we do interest, okay? So, I have my payer. We're going to talk about the one that's right on there. Okay, and let's see here. All right. So I want you to turn for your exercise 4A on page 410. We're going to use that one because it's got numbers in there. Okay. So we talk a little bit about the interest, a little bit about tax wise. All right. So for my payer, I'm going to put First National in there. Okay. Don't forget to type in all caps. All right, you only have so much room, so you might get First National Bank. Okay, we did. Now, what's my next column say? 
box one. Oh, I'm excuse me. I'm on the wrong one. You guys are probably think, what is he doing? Star Bank, okay? Interest is the bottom one. All right. So my next column, what does it have? Has box one or three. What's that on my 1099 IMT? What's it say in box one? Interest, right? What's it say in box three? Interest on what? Same yep, so that we know which one's which, okay? Okay, so we have those box one and box three, okay? In this case, we just have something in box one. All right, so we have $1,543.32, okay? So we put our interest in there. Anybody have any idea or figured out yet what TSJ is? With the, no, it's different letters. It's the thing for the job. TSJ. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, so, all right. TSJ is something different, okay? Anybody have any idea? Taxpayer, spouse, and joint. So if you have that couple that has a nice, and they each have their own savings, own checking account, or you realize that you're at a year where there may be a divorce, probably a good idea to keep track of who's the suits, okay? Because the lawyer, when they see the return, you know, if it's not on there, they might say, oh, I'll just give that all to my client, okay? So that's just kind of what that's there. It's just a reference, not mandatory, okay? Now, our next column over, okay, we have a little thing that says plus and minus. Why might we use this? What did we talk about? If this said U.S. savings bonds, $1,543, what am I going to do with that interest for the state? Negative, right? Yeah, I'm going to negate it out. So you'll put a little negative and then put the amount. So that way it automates. And that's why I say you don't put it on the B, because if you type on the B and just the interest and you don't have an area to do this, you might not get the interest to the, it'll go as taxable interest to New York, okay? So in this case, if we had something that was a state adjustment, this $1,543 was all uh, US bonds, we'd say negative, okay? All right, okay. Um, the next column over, after the state adjustment, we have the letters N-A-E-O-B, okay? All right. What I want you to do is hit F1. It's going to bring up our little help menu. All right. And, and where's our French per Gene, you're the French person. You can change your help menus to Spanish if you'd like, if you're, since you're bilingual. All right, but we're going to scroll down, and we're going to get to a thing. You're going to see a blue headline that says N-A-E-O-B, okay? All right. What those are is sometimes you will get interest that has different designations, and if it has a designation like that, you'll put that right on this form so that it'll go to the correct spot in the tax return. Again, for your interests, or for your interest, for your knowledge, knowledge of interest, um, we have the nominee thing that talks about interest as, interest as nominee if the client received it on the 1099 INT or other statement reporting interest income, but the interest actually belongs to someone else. So maybe we're not having it taxable because it showed up on our thing, but it really wasn't ours. Okay, uh, crude interest. Exempt interest, this is one that we may see, you may see a little bit of if somebody has something in a retirement account or an investment account, they may have exempt interest inside of there. So in that column, besides the possible state adjustment, we put it exempt and then it'll subtract itself out so that it won't make it taxable. Um, don't worry too much about the original issue discount, don't see a lot of those, okay? And then uh, the last one is amortized bond premium adjustment. Um, again, those will come to you. You don't have to know how to calculate those. Those will come to you on the state. But it's just so that you know those letters, if you see something that you understand what those letters mean, okay? Otherwise, you're gonna think, what is a, what is a naming up, naming up? 
Nanny up, Nanny up. Um, typically not on the 1099. Um, typically you'd see them if somebody has a, like I said, a brokerage or an investment account. There's a bunch of different things put together. It has stocks, it has bonds, it has municipal stuff like that. You'd see it in there. Okay. All right. Um, page one of something like that has all those listed line by line with their description so that you just know that you have to put that letter next to that interest designation. Okay. The interest statements that we see for bank accounts and savings bonds are going to look just like the ones you see there. Okay. No, you don't have to be half of a broker to figure out. So don't worry about it. Like I said, this is all for your knowledge. Don't get hung up on the terminology. Okay. All right. If we keep going down there, there's another column that we have um, that is a AMT PAB. Okay. If you scroll down a little farther, you see that, okay? All right, and again, this is something that based on somebody's income or their bond activity, that's private activity bonds, it talks about if it's gonna be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Don't worry about it. This is finance, college finance stuff. It'll be explained to you on there. It's just something that you have to understand that when you see that, you understand where it goes and how you designate it, okay? All right? Don't worry, in probably the first 100 problems that you do, you won't see any of these, all right? Okay, or the first 50 returns, okay? So it's just for your knowledge on that. All right, so back on the thing, then their next column over, early penalty. If I have interest on a CD and I'm penalized for taking it out early, that is something that I can deduct in my taxes and adjustment to my income, so I'll put it there. Again, it's a box on our 1099 INT, so we don't have to worry about that and the tax withheld on there. So you can see these correspond with all your tax, your boxes on your interest statement. All right? Okay. Any questions on those? All right. Now, let's go back to 4-7. So what do you think my statement's going to be about dividends? Dividends go on a Schedule B, but what, Tim? <laughs> okay, but we don't put them on a Schedule B, okay? So that being said, if I'm back on my Schedule B and you can find it in your tree on the left, top half, part one is interest. If I go down to part, well, and then when you're back there too, if you typed anything in, what happened? flowed right over where we needed to, didn't it? So it's on the Schedule B, but we didn't put it on there, did we? Okay. Part two, dividends. So the fact that I say this, what's everybody thinking right out of the gate? I'm gonna go in that little box A, click on my link. I have a dividend statement. I'm gonna open that guy up, okay? So, dividends. Again, everything looks just like what we saw on Dividend statement that's in our book. Got it? Anybody there? No. Okay, so go back to Schedule B. Okay, so go back to Schedule B. Okay. Now scroll down to the bottom. Whoop, there's our part two. See where those gray boxes are? Oh, part two dividends. Yeah, okay. Close here. Yep, that A. Click on that guy, click your link. All right, you should have a little thing that says dividend statement. All right, and once you're there, you can see that all these boxes start to look just like what we're seeing with our dividends. Dividends are distributions of money, stock, or other property paid to the taxpayer by a corporation, partnership, estate, or trust, okay? They're made in the form of a cash payment, but could also be in the form of more stock, property, or services. Dividends aren't always realized. You pay tax on the realization of the dividend. Sometimes you may not actually receive that, as it says, where they get you a dividend check, but you're paying tax on the dividend when it's realized because what they're doing is having you pay little bites as you go along instead of waiting till you sell that stock at the end and paying tax on a big amount. 
The theory is that maybe your tax situation is better to pay it a little bit than the big, you know, when you sell the stock, you maybe have a big gain on the sale of your stock and you have to pay tax on all those dividends at the end, okay? So that's kind of what the concept is with that, all right? Again, dividend statements, we'll see them just like this, all right? You'll see them on this form or you might see them on the investment form, okay? Same thing, there's ordinary dividends, and then there's qualified dividends, and as it says in there, sometimes they're taxable at different percentage rates. Don't get caught up on that. That's a formulation. I just want you to understand the difference between ordinary and qualified, okay? And then a lot of times we'll see things too, as it shows on page four seven, it talks about uh, capital gains. Same thing, sometimes the gain within that stock we pay tax on it as we go along so that we're paying little bites so at the end we don't have tax on a big amount, okay? And then sometimes you'll see foreign tax, all right? You might have a stock, I would see quite a, I think his name's Lord Abbott, I don't know who Lord Abbott is, but he's got a lot of foreign holdings, this be a British company, and there's always foreign tax paid. So I have stock that I'm helping a corporation in England or wherever Lord Abbott is invested in, and uh, that that I'm paying that tax, I get as a credit. Okay, so it'll carry over there, all right? Okay, and we'll talk about how that goes in when we talk about other taxes and payments. But what I want you to do, go back over the page we were on, and at the top, First National Bank. So on page 410, we have First National Bank, okay? All right, so I own stock in First National Bank. How many people own stock in First Niagara? How many bought stock in First Niagara before it was? So. All right, so we have that. Our little thing says in box 1A, ordinary dividends, 23.23.99. Our qualified dividends, 444. All right, again, we have taxpayer spouse joint. All right, as a column for state adjustments, um, don't really see any of that, so we're not gonna worry about it right now, okay? As you can see on there, we have a capital gain distribution, so you can see where it says capital gain. All right, okay, and in this case, we have uh, the columns with 1250 gain and 28% gain. We'll talk about a little bit later when we get into the Schedule D with capital gains, okay? Right now, you're not gonna see a lot of that. So we'll talk about how the different tax on selling stock is, is recorded. Uh, but the dividend in this case, we have some federal withholding. Oops. Fat fingers in. All right. Okay. And then the last columns that we don't have anything in here, if we have some exempt interest dividends, obviously when you hear, see the word exempt, probably don't want to put that in, right? Because it's going to lower our taxable. And then we have that AMT, that alternative minimum tax column. Okay. So again, you can see that if you look at your 1099 DIV, everything kind of mirrors it, doesn't it? Qualified ordinary dividends. All right. Any questions there? You feel like you just took a finance brokerage class? So now when you're when uh, M and T sends you that thing that's 48 pages long, you're gonna know what all that says on there. Instead of just going to the last page and saying, oh, okay, that's what it's worth. Okay. You kind of look in there and see what's happening. All right, and that's one of the things you're gonna kind of learn too, is that you'll see stuff. Because you may say something to your clients is, do you realize, you know, and I've had clients where I've gone, oh, this is great, we get to deduct $5,000 worth of transaction fees. And go, excuse me? I said, yeah, right here on the last page of the statement, that's uh, something that we can put on your itemized, is that part of your investment expense that you're paying that $5,000 to your stock transactions. Really? So, surprised I haven't gotten more phone calls from brokers saying, you can't be telling them that. It's right there on the statement, so, okay? But yeah, so you'll kind of kind of understand with all those. All right? Any question on interest or dividends? So what's the moral of our story? Interest and dividends go on a 
but they don't go on the, okay, all right. And like I said, it's just a matter so that when you're putting the information in and that, from that 1099 IMT and that 1099 dividend, that you have all those columns. Because if you look at that Schedule B, yeah, it's where it goes. But when I go back to my Schedule B right now, and if I click on my Schedule B and I go back, I have my interest in the top from Star Bank and my dividends from First National Bank at the bottom. But there's a whole lot more information when I did that, wasn't there? Okay, so you, know, you can see on your Schedule B, you got your two amounts. And then if we go over to all the way back to the 1040 page one, you can see that everything went right where it needs to be. My taxable interest, my ordinary dividends, and my qualified dividends, okay? That's why we don't put it right on the B, because if we just put it right on the B, yes, it would get to 1040. There's a lot of things that we did. The ordinary, or excuse me, the qualified wouldn't have shown up, or tax withholding wouldn't have shown up, anything like that. Okay? All right? All right. We're going to take about five minutes. Then we'll, we'll, we'll go right through the rest of Chapter 4, so we got time to work on problems. So about a five-minute break. There is coffee up here. Uh, there's some Timbits. There's some, uh, for those of you that are don't want to be heard. All right. So, we're working on unearned income. Uh, now we're going to talk about alimony. All right. And alimony is a payment to or for a spouse or former spouse under a divorce or separation instrument. It does not include voluntary payments that are not made under a divorce or separation instrument. Okay? As it shows on 416 there, talks about the things that payments are alimony if all of the following are true. Payment are not alimony if any of the following are true. Okay? Um, the quick finder, you know, in New York they use the term maintenance quite often. Um, the quick finder talks about that a little bit. Okay. I'm not trying to tell you what it says here. <laughs> Besides, it's under the header of cost of getting into this. Okay. Of course, that that was funny. All right. Talks about alimony payments are deducted by the payer and included in income by the recipient. Only, pay, only payments that meet certain requirements qualify as alimony for tax purposes. Differing terms such as maintenance, maintenance and support, or spousal support may be used in a divorce decree to describe payments that may or may not qualify as alimony. Does that make sense to anybody? So, Basically, what it's saying is, how good was your lawyer? Okay, what terms did he use? All right, if I am divorced and I am paying my wife alimony, she has to declare that as income and I get to deduct it as an expense. If I'm paying maintenance that is for the upkeep of the home or the care of children, she does not have to declare it as income, neither do I get to use it as an expense. Child support, things like that is not alimony, okay? So, I have a client that is divorced. Her alimony settlement equates to $80,000 a year in alimony, all right? Very good lawyer. She was thrilled with that. Till the first time she did taxes, we discovered that $80,000 was alimony that was reported and has to be reported on her taxes. So it's like she had an $80,000 job and never had any withholding taken on it. So you can imagine what the tax bill was. And obviously, she said to me, he got me again. Okay? However, 
the lawyer was good enough on the other side to say, sure, we'll do that, because what did he know for his client? He was obviously a very wealthy man, and he has a nice $80,000 deduction because he gets to claim the $80,000 that he pays. All right? So you can see alimony, it just depends on how it's termed. If the divorce decree says that it's for maintenance or support of the children, that's child support. Or maintenance of the home, you know, it has to be alimony, okay? That's why it talks about it here. Uh, to qualify as alimony, payments must be in cash. Payments must be required by a decree or written separation. Um, spouses may not be members of the same household. Obviously, that must come up because two people got divorced and decided to pay alimony to one, and then they're still living together, and he gets taken the deductions, but they're still in the same house. Okay. Obviously, if it's in here, somebody tried to do it. Okay. Uh, payment may not be treated as child support. And payers' liability to make payments must cease upon the death of the recipients. All right, and the pay <laughs> parties may not file a joint return. Okay, payments that do not qualify as alimony, child support, non cash transfers. Okay, any idea what that might be? Real estate? Yeah, yeah. non cash, something. Yeah. Uh, payments that are the spouse's part of community property income. So, you know, signing over half of a rental or a duplex or something like that. Payments for use of property and payments to keep up the payer's property. Okay, so again, you can see you have to look at that decree and understand what is alimony. Alimony is alimony, okay? And maintenance in New York can be alimony because for some reason in New York they use the term maintenance. And if it's just a designated cash payment to the spouse, that's alimony. But if maintenance is defined as upkeep of the property or for the children, it's not. Okay? All right? So the moral of the story is read your divorce decree and make sure you got a good lawyer. Okay? And the other, other moral of the story is before you sign your divorce decree, consult your tax preparer. You know, always say that in the bottom of the little things with investments, always consult a tax preparer beforehand, okay? All right, page 418, we got the K-1 income. Um, again, K-1s, we're just gonna mention them real simple. You may see some when somebody, uh, the best example that you may see is if you have a client that is very artistic and they're writing books or um, you know, and scheduling with rental and stuff like that, they might have something, they might get a K-1 from something that they get a share of, okay? All right, so, because it's going to go on that line there with uh, royalties and uh, uh, rental property, things like that, okay? All right. But most of the time, they're coming from partnerships or corporations, or somebody might get one from an estate if they're part of that. All right. 419 is unemployment. Unemployment is taxable income. And most of the time, withholding is a good idea because a lot of people don't do withholding on their unemployment and don't realize it's taxable income. All right? Okay. Um, in New York, I will give you a heads up. Last year was the first year in New York no longer sends you the little 1099Gs for unemployment. And it was a nightmare last year because unless you know your client or you specifically ask them, you need to say to them, hey, did you get a 1099G? And they go, no. And trust me, do not send them to the unemployment office down the street because they'll send them back. And they'll look at you and say, they wouldn't give it to them. You have to go online to get them, all right? If you have an individual that's not filing it's their unemployment benefits online, they do it by phoning in. There's a little link that they'll have in the office for you that you can go on to the New York website. Otherwise, they just have to call and wait for the mail to them and request it. So they don't send them out automatically. New York's saving money, I guess, for paper and postage. But you know what else New York's then doing? All of a sudden, you're not reporting income. Now they get interest and penalties because somebody's tax return's not active. Or not accurate, I should say. 
because a lot of people just forget about it. If they didn't get the little document, and unless you ask them, they'll forget. Okay? All right. But unemployment is uh, right on there. That's one of the other. Okay? Now, page 420. We are going to get into other income. As you can see there on the top of 420, it talks about a bunch of different things that will go on line 21. So if you have your 1040 page one in front of you, you can scroll right down there to line 21, and basically it says other income. And just as it says there, anything that hasn't happened in lines one through 20 is gonna happen there. So we talk about, uh, probably won't run into a lot of Alaska permanent fund dividends, okay? We don't have any Alaska residents in here, do we? Or Eskimos, anybody Eskimo, okay? Um, court awards and damages, taxable ones include interest, lost wages, business damages, emotional distress and attorney fees. Non-taxable income is compensatory damages for physical injury or illness, okay? So you can see, you know, when you get a lawsuit settlement, sometimes it's taxable, sometimes it's not. Um, employee awards and bonuses. Everybody's claiming their Tim Horton cards they get, correct? Okay. Depends how due diligence your uh, preparer or your uh, employee is. Um, the class I taught yesterday filling in, somebody there was shocked. Their employer says, hey, we have season tickets for the Sabres. Would you like to have them? Well, sure. Okay, she took the tickets, private box, parking. Okay, next thing she knew, pay stub and W-2, she had to declare that. Okay, because the employer, if they're using it as an expense, somebody's got to declare it as income, right? So they gave it to the employee to declare his income. Or, who hears call in radio, likes to call and try to win things? Very careful. I was listening to WDEN on the way up because I listened for our commercials to see what's still on and what they're running. Um, for EG Tax, giving away Tim McGraw tickets. Win those tickets. Guaranteed, WDEN is going to be sending you a 1099. Okay? Yes? But if, so if the employer did that, then you would that would be on your W 2. Yeah, as income. But if they didn't, if they that be themselves somehow, then it doesn't matter. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, trust me, I don't want anybody, I don't want to spread the word because I don't want you, when you're, you're getting the good graces of your employer and your bills tickets, I don't want you going, you're going to make me pay tax on this one. Okay. Obviously, that's probably not good employee employer relationships. Okay. Um, but it's just for your knowledge. Okay. I have a client uh, two years ago. A little thing called Jam in the Valley down by Berryford where they have all the concerts and the campers. Believe it or not, one couple won a new truck and the 50 50 for the weekend. Both. Okay? They were thrilled with the new truck. They even drove it in to do their taxes. They weren't real happy when I got done with their taxes because they got a 1099 for a $28,000 pickup truck. No tax with that. And they also got a 1099 for their half of the 50 50. Okay, so, all right. She came in the next year and I asked her, I said, so what'd you win? Because I'm figuring, you know, you win twice in one year. She goes, I took my husband's money away and we didn't buy any raffle tickets that weekend. We learned our lesson. We have a new truck, okay? Um, hobbies, this one's gonna be, we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, hobby income, if it's under $400, okay? Um, if you're in any illegal activities, all right, you need to declare your income. So I don't know if we have anybody that's dealing drugs here and making a profit doing it, but if you're going to declare your income for illegally dealing drugs, this is where you put it on your tax return, okay? Enough said, right? All right, jury pay, kickbacks, prizes and awards we talked about, and rents from personal property. Um, uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to rental income, okay? Um, because of the way that's handled. Um, can the big ones we see are canceled debts, gambling winnings, and then the 1099 miscellaneous. Canceled debts, 
Um, what that is, if uh, I have a $5,000 credit card debt, it just can't be paid. I get a phone call, some credit collection agency has bought my debt, says, give me $1,200, we'll forget the rest. Okay? Sounds like a great deal, sure. Well, I do my taxes, I have to now declare that $3,800, the difference between the two, as income. Okay? So if you have anybody, same thing applies with student loans. If there's forgiveness on student loans, you know, all the thing that they're running on uh, the political campaigns, you know, they're talking about, oh, we'll set up programs to have forgiveness of student loans. Sounds great. A college student that has, you know, $50,000 in student loan wouldn't want half of it forgiven. But by the way the tax law is written, that can be income, forgiveness of debt. So they'll pay tax on it. So the government's going to do what? On one end, I'm forgiving you for your student loan, but on the other hand, I'm saying, now you can pay my salary. Okay? All right? So there's always two sides to the story. Foreclosures, same thing. Sometimes in a foreclosure, there's situ situations where um, the um, income, you know, the loss or selling below or whatever it may be or whatever it is, you know, if they forgive you for the remainder of your loan or mortgage, it can be considered income. Now, there are ways to get people away from that when it's, uh, there's a form you put in for insolvency. And, you know, when the housing market was going south, you know, 99% people were not paying on that foreclosure just because they were insolvent, okay? All right, and then like I said, gambling winnings. If anybody goes to a casino, boy, they print that ticket out in a hurry, don't they? And it right to you, because you know, if they're paying you an X number of dollars, especially with 1,200 now, I think, 1,200, minimal, for a W, for W2G, I think it's 1,200, okay? They'll have you pay that tax maybe on the spot 10%. Scratch tickets, New York tanks 10% right out of the gate. They don't want to wait for you to file your taxes. All right, so if you win anything, it's just like when somebody wins a lottery. Yeah, I won $100 million, but I went home at 30. Okay, they take the tax on the spot. All right, and believe it or not, I do have a client that is a New York lotto winner. All right, okay. Going back to divorces, he needs a new lawyer. I told him that first time he came in to me, he had somebody else do it. I ended up helping him with his health insurance. He's thrilled now I do his tax return. Um, the proceeds from the winnings are paid to him. Okay? So he obviously has gambling winnings from the lottery, so he pays tax. I think he's getting $1.5 million a year or something for 25 years, whatever it is. So he pays the tax, okay? However, he got divorced after he won. His wife divorced him. She gets half of his gross, but it's not alimony. So he's paying tax on the whole amount. She's getting half the gross tax free. So, all right. He was one of my ones. I said, Do you, got a, you sure you want a new lawyer? Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you understand how that one's pretty good, huh? Okay. All right. And so we'll talk about the 1099 miscellaneous. We talked about cancellation of debt. You can see on the bottom of 421 all the different codes, uh, depending on what that discharge of that debt is. Okay. So I have all those. All right. Um, page 423, we have gambling winnings. Um, again, the one thing too to remember about gambling is there is this misconception out there that you can write off your losses. It talks in there a little bit. You read about the uh, rule report. You know, the people that have the little, remember those little curly cord things when they got the card hanging off their hip and it's stuck in the machine. Um, the, uh, you know, those record your gambling. And it's, it's your net wins and losses. That's not necessarily an amount that we can put against a big win. We can only put losses, okay? I had a client, one on the scratch off tickets, one of the 777, where he won $7,777 a month for seven years, whatever. It was a combination of sevens. Um, I said, do you have any losses to offset that? He goes, come with me. Walks me out to his pickup truck. 
about this deep, and the cab of the pickup truck is a bunch of loser scratch off tickets. I'm looking at it and going, sure, there's not another winner in there? He wanted to write those off, but can I? What do you think? Can I write off all those scratch off tickets that he threw in his truck? What's that? No receipt. Exactly. How do I know when he bought those? That could be five years worth of tickets. If I'm doing a cash basis and following, okay? That's where I'm always fascinated with people that losers and they have shoe boxes full of them in their garages, rubber band together, okay? Because yeah, those are losers. I can write off my losses against winnings, but how do I know when they bought those? You know, it's, it's tough, okay? That's where the casino ones are always nice because it shows that they were there and they had losses. But you can't write off their net, you know, lock. And I'm fascinated because I think 100% of the time they bring those little statements, everybody's losing. I mean, they're all showing negative numbers. I've never seen one walk in, they had a winner and they said, here, and they showed a profit game. Never seen one. Okay? Fascinating way it works, right? Yep. And, uh, my half sister's husband is a lawyer in Vegas for one of the casinos, and I can tell you why that's the case. So, all right. Um, so we have that, and again, we talked about the losses. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into itemize, because you can itemize the losses. All right, and it talks about on there. Uh, top of two four twenty four, you see the little W two G. Again, it's a W two. Has all of our little boxes. Okay. Um, 1099 miscellaneous on page 425. Obviously now we're kind of to a statement that you see a picture of on 426. We have a tax document from the IRS that basically is uh, covering anything else that we haven't done in line one through 20, okay? On those, we see that there's several boxes with different things in them. All right, so if you go over to 427, talks about each one of those boxes. Box one talks about it is a, a rent received. So if I have, we see these quite a bit if, if somebody owns something that's rent subsidized, that the, the person renting the property pays some portion and then the county or the city pays the other portion. We see those more so. Uh, Schedule E royalties, if somebody's writing books, writing songs, Okay, and I actually found out two weeks ago, my wife's cousin wrote the Nationwide jingle, the one that uh, Peyton Manning does. Everybody, everybody know what that one is? Yeah, yeah, chicken, yeah, that's what I know it is, it's so chicken farm, so, but uh, yeah. So I don't know how much he's getting, I haven't heard, but I guess every time that thing's hummed or played, he has a royalty. I didn't think it was that great of a thing to write, but apparently that's the way it works, okay? Um, we have uh, talks about uh, other income. This is income that is not self-employment income. It's truly other income, okay? Um, it, uh, we have box four, talks about uh, federal income tax withheld. Uh, box five, you know, we don't, you know, there's not many fish left in Lake Erie, so we don't see a lot of this one, okay? If we were uh, down in Louisiana with the shrimp boats, we'd probably see something there, okay? Box six, uh, report amount on Schedule C or CEZ, okay? All right. That is medical and health care payments, all right? So if my employer, where this comes up is... Um, Sometimes what happens with uh, somebody that retires before the age of Medicare is that as opposed to continuing their health care from their employer, their employer may say to them, here's $10,000 for you to buy your own health insurance between now and when you reach Medicare. That may be taxable. Okay, so if they're paying you or paying your premiums and considering a compensation, that's where you might see this. Because you're not still a W-2 employee, but somebody's paying something for you, and obviously if somebody's taking it as an expense, the other side of the equation, we have to have somebody show it as what? Income. Okay? So, I had a gentleman yesterday that he's a member of a union down in the South Towns, 
and they renegotiate things. And uh, one of the local government entities came to him and says, oh, we'll just give you this X number of dollars. You can go buy your own insurance. I said, you have to want to check. Might be compensation. You might pay tax on that. Not the way they sold it, but okay. Uh, box seven is the one we'll see the most of with 1099 miscellaneous. Uh, Non-employee compensation. Okay, so if the amount is under four hundred dollars, we put it on line twenty-one. If it's over four hundred dollars, we go to a schedule C and C E Z, which we'll talk about later when we do self-employment. Now, this one's one that always gets me because if we get a 1099 miscellaneous with that box and it's over 400, we have to put it on a Schedule C. However, the law states that if non-employee compensation is greater than, or is less than $600, you do not have to issue a 1099 miscellaneous. So yeah, I'm getting a few deer in the headlight, but those numbers don't line up. Exactly. The numbers don't match, do they? So what happens if I get a 1099 miscellaneous for 500? Well, A, over 400, so I have to put it on Schedule C, but B, that person really didn't have to give it to me because it wasn't $600. Okay, see where I'm kind of, the numbers don't match, all right? So that's just kind of a point of fact, all right? But we'll cover more of that when we do self-employment, okay? Um, page 429 and 430, show a little bit about the Schedule C. That's just there for your reference. We'll cover it later, don't worry about it, don't get hung up on it right now, okay? Uh, reason I say that, we're just gonna use the CEZ when we talk about the problems. Um, Self-employment tax, what happens is if you run your own business and you make $10,000 profit, okay, on your tax return with the IRS, you pay your Social Security and your Medicare. That's what self-employment tax is. You know, when we have a W-2 paycheck, we see that come out. An individual that has their own business and gets that money is, uh, you know, on a Schedule C is self-employment or an independent contractor or you know, I make $10,000 making birdhouses for the craft show, okay? On my tax return, I pay not only income tax on that, but I also pay my Social Security and my Medicare, which amounts to about 16% of whatever my profit is, okay? Nice thing about that, if I've been self-employed, say I'm a consultant, self-employed my whole life, at least I'm paying into the Social Security, all right? That's where um, you know people that are bartenders and and uh, waitresses. You know, when you look at their W twos with that Social Security wages, you know they think it's great because they're getting all this tax free money up front. But when they get sixty five and they can't, you know, make it between the tables to carry the pancakes, their Social Security credit's not going to be as much. But it's lower report. Same thing with the self employment. This is great, I'm writing off all these expenses, I'm not paying tax on the money I'm making, but later on when you go to apply for Social Security, it doesn't show that you really have any income. So, and I've had people come in that way and they can't believe how low their Social Security is and they say, you had no income. Well, I made X number of dollars, yeah, but you only reported after expenses this amount, okay? So that's what those two are, all right? Okay, and then on 431, after we've distinguished and categorized and everything, we get the statement, income can both be taxable and non-taxable. All right, famous statements. Some instances of income that is not taxable are the following. Inheritances, foster care payments, child support, disaster relief. Obviously with Matthew going through, any of those people that are down there that have had that bad luck. Uh, federal income tax refund. Wouldn't that be great if the government taxed your money twice? Okay. Uh, gifts. Again, we have to be careful. All right. Insurance proceeds, life insurance, medical insurance, rebates, veterans and welfare benefits, and as we talked about earlier, workers' comp. Okay. All right. Any questions?
Yes. Ten ninety nine miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. So you have someone that didn't get a ten ninety nine miscellaneous, and they earned under six hundred dollars from the um, source. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a ten ninety nine, um, but they earned that money. You still that it's still taxable. Yeah, when we get into Schedule C's, just because you're self-employed, you're not necessarily going to get that 1099 miscellaneous. Okay. Uh, prime example, Mary Kay. Okay. Um, they're independent contractors. They go out, they have their parties, they sell their cosmetics. The only way they get a 1099, 1099 miscellaneous from Mary Kay is if they get prizes. Okay. As far as their income, and as far as their income, it's their job to keep track of their income from what they sell, bring it to me with the cost of what their goods were, and then we figure it out. So yeah, they're not getting a 1099 miscellaneous from Mary Kay, only for prizes that Mary Kay gives directly to them. So if they're buying the goods wholesale, no 1099. When they sell it, they have their income coming in, but Mary Kay doesn't track that. So that's kind of an example of where Yes, you would put income right on the Schedule C, but you don't have a 1099 to have what that amount is. We're just going by their records. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So, yes? Um, for the 1099, if you win a prize mm -hmm. and they don't give you a 1099, mm -hmm. um, I know people, you know, we wanted to make one so we didn't claim them, which we never got because we didn't know how to get Yeah. But, um, if you claimed it, how would you know how much it was worth? Um, again, you know, we'll talk later about things with fair market value. Okay. Um, you just call them and ask them? Yeah. Okay. yeah. By right, you know, and, and mo again, most businesses, if they're doing things like that, they're maybe writing it off as an expense. Like they used it like took our picture and used it as advertising, so I would think they would want to find it. Yeah, yeah, and some don't. Um, again, you know, if there's no 1099 generated, um, are you obligated? Well, since you brought it up to me, I'm doing your taxes, and then you add it on there. Well, that was 30 years ago, we went on a trip. I'm, I'm, 60 I'm, years I'm, ago. I'm sending you to have you audited. So, <laughs> all right. Um, That's too long. <laughs> never, never pass the statute of limitations. No, just kidding. Um, oh, speaking of that, one thing about statute, you know, three years for amendment. We'll talk about those later and typically everybody will ask you how long do I need to keep my tax records I tell them seven years after seven years you know you can get rid of tax returns if you want to I being the geek that I am I still have my first tax return from when I worked when I was 14. My kids laugh and look at it and say that's all you made it's like yeah minimum wage was a dollar 85 at one time um the um but that's a statute on that so 30 years ago, no, she can't come on. Okay, all right, but good question on it. Um, you know, if you won two tickets and it wasn't reported, and by right, you should declare that as income because it's a prize. You know, you just have to figure out the face value of those two tickets to a concert that you received or the value of those airline tickets or whatever. At this day and age with most businesses, they're gonna wanna keep track of those things that are expenses or giveaways. And if they do, their accountant's gonna generate a I, I make 1099s for people all the time because once something's over six hundred dollars, if I'm gonna allow them to write it off, I'm saying, hey, if you're writing it off, better close the circle and give whoever relates to this stuff. Um, one is a prime example is um, I have a couple over-the-road truckers that are movers, and they tend to contract labor. They get to a city, they hire some people that they know about. To help unload the furniture for the moving company. They don't travel with the people, it's just contract labor. Well, they're paying them over 600 and said, hey, get their social security number 1099 because if you're audited for that, you need to have a record that you paid somebody that amount. And you need to declare it as income. Like you're going to prize and it costs you money because we want to pull, but we have to pay 500 to have it installed. Yeah, so typically stuff. that won't be prizes, are usually things that you win. Not okay. Um, we had a trip we wanted to get off or something because it was putting everything in the Yeah, I've so seen, yeah, the volunteer fire companies they must have gotten trouble somewhere along the line. So when they have their meat raffles, and gun raffles, and all that stuff, if you win, they give you a 1099. 
And I think a lot of that has to do with nonprofit status because they have to track who's entitled to keep the nonprofit. You forgot because you didn't know, but she didn't. Does the government have three years if they catch you? I mean, you just say, oh, I didn't know, and then they do bill you. Is this your lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm just wondering, like, because most people probably don't know you because reporting. Yeah. Um, again, it's disclosure. You know, being somebody that you know you have credentials to be able to do tax returns and compensate oh, okay. once the information right. but if they forgot, you know, yeah. maybe yes, yeah, something would happen that you know because they may she may have forgotten. Mm -hmm. But whoever she won the prize from, if their books are audited and they say, well where did this money go? We don't know that you didn't just pocket it. Oh, you gave it away because you bought tickets or a pool or whatever. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, she'd probably get a 1099 later on, mm -hmm. and then we'd have some things to be able to protect her and try to say, hey, she was not aware. And then, uh, yeah. so, but now she's aware <laughs> that she wins a big prize. Okay. Yeah, well, so, good. boy, you're going to be a spoiler on your husband, aren't you? Don't sign up for that raffle. We're going to have to pay tax on it. Yeah, so my husband's account. <laughs> so, yes. So, yeah, it's just, it's a case, you know, again, it's a bookkeeping thing because somebody, when, all you have to think about the two sides of the equation. If somebody's writing it off as an expense and they're giving it to somebody else, who's, where's the income side? The IRS wants to know where the other side is. Because if you're writing it off and you have to prove it and I'm giving that money to Tim, I have to show, and then what are they going to come up to Tim and go, hey, Tim, did you really get this $5,000 from Tim? Okay. And he's going to go, nah, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> then I'm in trouble because I'm saying I have $5,000 expenses I'm writing on. And then if I prove it that I you did it, then who's going to be the next one to knock on? So, now you have a question? Yeah, going back to uh, canceling debts. Peter, uh, this form 1099C, where did, who sends the cancellation of debt? The credit card companies. They will. Yeah, this this is a sticking situation because you know credit collection agencies are such fly-by-night organizations. You know, they open and close quicker than you can imagine. Yeah, my daughter works for one. So. Yeah, and, and chances are, in the time that she works for them for a year, they'll change your name three times because they got in trouble for. Her. You know, inappropriate behavior, I guess. Yeah, she's in the new one now. Exactly, exactly. Because they make calls, threatening calls, things like that. So they turn them in, they get in trouble. Um, but their bookkeeping is not real great. But yes, they would just, you know, cancel that. You see them, like all the time, City Bank was a uh, credit card from City Bank. Uh, like I said, student loans when they're forgiven. Um, the other thing with forgiveness of debt, sometimes the student loans, they'll approach you and say, okay, we're going to forgive half of your student loans, but you have to declare his income because you're going to get a 1099-C. Then they'll advise you that in order for this to benefit you, you need to do married filing separate. Okay? Because what happens is basically they may be giving you forgiving tens of thousands of dollars of college debt. It's like a job. It's like you get income. Married filing separate, then you're paying tax on that. So that it's not taxed at a higher rate on joint return than you with your spouse's income. Well, that's great, but what do we know about married filing separate? We pay the higher tax. Higher tax and on the person that has the income. Right. Plus, we may lose out on some itemized or some credits, things like that. So the credit or the student loan company is correct, but you have to look at your case because what you save by that forgiveness. May just totally be washed away by the increase in the tax bill that you have because you're doing very fine and separate. So again, you know, these student loan things are gonna make paint this rosy picture that this is the greatest thing and you do this and look at all the money you're gonna save and not have to worry about. Can you come see you do the taxes? Well, on another point on the, let's use your example of the five thousand dollar credit card loan. Yes, you call it the settle for twelve hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And you have to pay thirty-eight hundred. I had heard or read someplace that there are negotiations you can make for that. that yes. Thirty-eight hundred, because you, you mentioned there are ways to get around that. Yeah. So you know, with cancellation debt, like I talked about, we saw quite a bit with the housing collapse uh, when you were doing returns after two thousand eight. You know, we didn't see a lot of that in Western Texas. 
houses work values low, houses are freezing. Um, but the cancellation of debt on foreclosure, you do insolvency. And you do this little worksheet that we have. Um, you prove that your assets, what you own, is far less than your liabilities, what you owe. And we're right down to, you know, how much paying for rent, things like that. And we have the car loan, mortgage stuff, where, you know, what's your liability, and what do you own? So, you do that if you show that somebody's been solvent and they don't have to pay tax. The last point like it says loan modifications for the mortgage. Does that include is that considered like a cancellation of the debt as well? Yes, because you know when you're talking about when you're adjusting what you owe. Yeah. So you know if I'm taking in and my mortgage is a hundred thousand dollars and they're doing a modification, say we're gonna modify it to eighty thousand. Because of the value or whatever, and then have you pay off the mortgage on that eight thousand. Basically, it's like they just gave me twenty thousand dollars for coding the mortgage. So, what are they probably doing with that twenty thousand? They're using it as an expense. So again, passing the ten ninety nine here along with Tim, twenty thousand dollars, he's gonna pay tax. So what do we got here? Five, mm -hmm. twenty. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. The IRS can love you. Mm -hmm. So this is too long. Um, mm -hmm. My son is having his. Forgiven, he pays at twenty dollars a year, and he keeps working as go at a government job, mm -hmm. and it's going to be forgiven, so he doesn't have to declare that. Then typically, there's some other things that's, that they're not. Again, it depends on how the forgiveness is done. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, if you work, I think it's like five years or something. Like that, yeah, and, and basically, what that is, they're paying it off. Yeah, the government. So it's not like a loan forgiveness. Yeah. Um, and sometimes too, with those, uh, you hear the term forbearance, because what they're doing is they lower your payments based on your income, and then you know all of a sudden once once they see you have income, and all of a sudden they load it up at the end. But so. he has the income now, but it's like twenty hours a year for a certain amount or something that he has to pay. It's a very long amount. Yeah, and, and that's where you can negotiate that you know, income base when they adjust. Student loans here, you're really right. I feel bad for my clients. I have a young lady that uh, is a pharmacist, and she's got a very good job at Walgreens. But she, you know, pharmacy school is eight years. And so four of it is grad school. And you're not getting scholarships and grants for grad school. You gotta find it your own. And by the time that she was done, and we do her taxes, and she's recently married, and they have their first child, she goes, you know, my student loan is twice what we're paying on the mortgage in the house. So it's, you know, her mortgage, her student loans are greater than the mortgage on the house. That seems to happen. So. All right. All right. So let's take five minutes again. And uh, we'll take five minutes again. And uh, then we'll come back and we'll do one of the problems in chapter four. Okay. Okay. So. What we'll do is, uh, we got what, about an hour, a little less. What time is it? 11? 11.09. Okay, good. So, and again, this is kind of the way the lecture works. We'll kind of go through things, do it like that. I hope to always leave at least an hour at the end. Uh, we can work on problems. And then, like I said, as you get farther along, you guys will start to interview each other and do in terms. Right? Because, again, if I don't hear that you understand how to ask the question, you know. You're the interview. It's not like the software that you might have on TurboTax or whatever where the interview is on the screen. You are the interview. Okay? So you have to be able to ask that question. And we won't disclose the name of the individual that asked about illegal activities while we're recording. All right? But if you have to ask about those illegal activities, you know, you need to know where that can go. Because if they say, oh yeah, I'm partaking in this racketeering industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm making uh, loan sharking money of about fifty thousand dollars. Okay, all right. I don't think they're going to go on the schedule C because they're probably not going to write down the expenses of their brass knuckles and you know whatever else they might have to you know have expenses. So chances are you got to know where that's going to go. Okay. Again, in the workbook, if you got your workbook, okay. If they look at the beginning of the chapter, there's little things in there, kind of what we talked about. Okay. All right. 
And the computer helps for the Schedule B if you want to make a note on there that says, for my computer, everything goes on the Schedule B, but nothing goes mm -hmm. on the Schedule B, okay? Because you can see there that uh, kind of shows you how to get to those. And it says on the Schedule B in the interest section, open an interest statement worksheet. You click on that little thing, you can see where it shows you to open that. And then enter all information from the 1099 INT directly onto the interest worksheet only. Okay, we should have put that in big bold letters, underlined. Only put it on the worksheet. So I'm on page 37 in the workbook. You can see there that the same thing applies to dividends. It does not go on the B, it goes on the worksheet. It's for your own sanity because those little things that are on that 1099 INT or DIB, we need to make sure that they would carry to the right spot, okay? Uh, there's some stuff about gambling winnings and other miscellaneous income. All right. Oh, one I forgot to talk about. I skipped the page, sorry. Uh, state refunds. Those are taxable, okay? Remember you used to get the little postcard from the state of New York, 1099G? It said, hey, here's your refund that's taxable. You need to report this on the federal. Nice enough from New York, because basically, what are you doing? Double well, tax, yeah, pay the money tax. I got that as a refund. How to pay tax on it again? It was my money that I paid tax on already. Um, a lot of times, you, those refunds are not taxable, nor is the entire portion. Um, for most people that have a larger state refund, is because they have children. You can back out the child tax credit on New York State. 330 for a, for a little one, for a rug rat or whatever you want to call them, okay? You can back that out. So if I have a $500 refund, I can back out and I have one child, I back out the 330. If I have a $500 refund, I got two kids, what happens? I have no taxable refund, okay? On the, and we'll, we'll show when we do the return here, I'll talk about it when we get into it. There's a line on there on the thing. There is a worksheet. The worksheet works great for a previous client because it's carrying forward the numbers you need from the previous year to determine if that refund is taxable. If not, you need to kind of know that, well, they got a $600 credit, but they had one child, so I can back that out. All right, we'll talk about that in the comments, all right? Okay, and then on the bottom of uh, page 40 there, you see all the little exceptions, okay? All right, so. What I want you guys to do, since you're all pros at getting this stuff in, all right, why don't you go ahead and start working on 4-1 for Mr. Sampson, okay, all right, and get his information in there, do a little read over on John's little biographical information, get his little information sheet and his W-2 in, okay. So if you guys want to get that in, and then we'll go through the problem together, okay? So I'll give you guys a head start. How's that? So on our ACA worksheet, we're looking at John. We can check that box. He did not have it from the marketplace. Okay, we've determined that. There's no 1095A, and we'll talk about those again later. Um, since he had insurance the whole year, we're not looking for any expense or exemptions. And then after his name, we checked the box that said he had minimum essential coverage for 12 months. So that cleans that one right up. Okay. Now, John has receipts of $52 of losses in lottery tickets. Make a note of that. Okay. All I want you to do is make a note of it and don't forget about it. Okay. So, let's go and let's do, on page 43, his W-2G. All right, so in your workbook, go to 43. All right, so we're on 1040, page one. Where's our, where's, where's our gambling winnings go? What line? 21. Line 21. So let's go down to 21. All the way to the right, we got a little box where we enter stuff, and what's it gives us? Great little link. Click on that. What's it show? 1040, worksheet seven. 
Click that guy open for me, okay? So highlight it, click it open. Looks like a whole nother tax return, doesn't it? <laughs> Where has this been hiding? I just got done and just tried to get off and do something to get it simple. Well, this is all these things that we were talking about plus some. You see we got gambling winnings. We got uh, 1099 miscellaneous. What's line three, anybody remember? Other income. What's line seven? Non-employed. And what's line eight? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> miscellaneous, anything? That's not that important. <laughs> All right. Um, we have on here too about uh, anybody got line eight? Remember? I don't. I don't remember either because I don't type it that often. What is our, our box eight on ten nine and miscellaneous is? Oh, substitutes in lieu of dividends. So you're getting money that is shown as a dividend income. You show it here, okay? Uh, education savings accounts, um, taxable distributions from those. These will show up here. When we get to the education stuff, we'll show you. In 529 plans you hear about in New York for tuition. I'll show you how to do those when we do the education stuff, okay? Um, we have some other things, foreign income. This is where if I have a client that is a US citizen but is married and living in Canada with their spouse that is a Canadian citizen, I have to use this line because there may be things that we exclude because they are a resident of another country paying taxes, okay? Otherwise, then the US government's doing what? Taxing their money twice, okay? I use this one quite often. I do several professors and I have one that is Austrian from the University of Buffalo. He brings in his tax return, it's written in Austrian, euros. So I have to sit and have him translate each line for me. I'm going, he handed it to me the first time. I'm like, I, I know those are numbers, but the rest of it doesn't even help me. So, all right. Um, boy, do they pay taxes in Austria. So, but there's Social Security. You live that long, it's worth it, okay? Um, so there's a whole bunch of other things here. You've got the, the jury pay that we talked about, duty pay, all right. Um, some other things that we might have on the income, but you can see down here at the bottom, a whole bunch of blank lines that say describe. So basically we got to a spot that if we can't find a home for it, this is where we would type in 1099-C, all right? So after Val's daughter, after Val's daughter calls us and gives, forgives our debt on our credit card from the credit collection agency, at the end of the year, Val, Val's daughter, what's her name? Sarah. So, so if Sarah calls, don't pick up the phone. <laughs> if uh, Sarah sends us a 1099-C at the end of the year, then we will put it on there. So we might have 1099-C Citibank and show what's on there, okay? For our purposes right now, we're going to go up to the top where it says gambling winnings from W2G. I like the little box. Click on our little link. What's in there? A W2G. Click on that. Open it up. All right. So we got it. So we're on our W2G. This was for John. He's the only one on the return. All right. We have an ID number for the My State Lottery. So we put that in. Okay. We have our, it says your lottery. So he was a lottery winner. Put the address in there for your lottery and it's on 76 River Street. Okay, and just pick a zip code. Box one, as it states on here, he won $421.11, okay? And he won it on 1231 of the tax year. He must have been out New Year's Eve, huh? Okay, no tax withheld. Already has my social security number in there. Already filled in everything else I need up the top for John's information, okay? So I have everything there. Now, I want you to scroll all the way to the bottom that form. What do you see on there? Gambling losses to be transferred to Schedule A. 
John was made, made sure that I knew he lost $52. And I say, okay, great, this is where I will enter that because I don't want you to not get credit for it, okay? So we put his $52 in there, all right? And then we say, have a good day, okay? Why? What I want you to do is go to the Schedule A, all right? So click on the Schedule A, all right? We'll get to this later, this is the itemized deductions, but I just wanna take you over there for right now, okay? So, let me try this. Let me make it any smaller. Okay. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, line 28, what do I see? Gambling losses. You got credit for it, but right now, his standard deduction is $6,300. What is his total deductions? 1106. So $52. He's not gonna help him, because he's got $6,300 for a standard deduction. When we get to standard versus itemize, this all makes sense. But obviously it's not helping him, okay? So yes, we put his losses in, but it does not help, okay? And that's, you have to stress that with everybody, all right? Okay, all right, so we have that in. So let's go back up to the 1040 page one, okay? So we've put in his W-2, we've put in the W-2G, and the last thing is we're gonna put in his interest income. And Tim, where does that go? It goes on the Schedule B, but not on the Schedule B, okay? So we're on our 1040 page one. We know that uh, we have interest income, so we scroll down into our income section on the 1040. Again, either A or B is fine. Highlight your box, find your little link. It says Schedule B, Interest in Ordinary Dividend Income. I'm gonna open that up. There's our beautiful Schedule B, which we do what with, Val? Do we, so you got the B? Just getting to it. Okay. So go to 8A or 8B or one of the boxes in there. Okay. So it's a beautiful little document. But what are we going to do with it, Val? Absolutely nothing. Okay. All right. We're going to go into our little field, open up our little worksheet, and then we have here our W-2, or excuse me, 1099 interest statement. It came from First National Bank. All right, okay, it's on page 43 in your workbook. Now, it says box one or three, what does this one fall in? Box three, doesn't it? So, put our 541 in there, okay? What's that tell us about our state adjustment? It's a US savings bond, what's that tell us in New York? Non-tax, okay? So if everybody's on there, I'm gonna start out with a little square here that's under the plus and minus. I'm gonna put a negative in there. And I'm gonna put my 541 in there. Okay? That's my state adjustment. Everybody got it? So that's where you have to know the law. That little table may be a great reference for you. You can go right down those two columns and say, is this taxable or is this non-taxable in the state of New York? All right, okay. And then we don't have to worry about it. There's really nothing else on there, all right? Now, what I want you to do, and I'm gonna kind of show you, this is gonna be kind of our, one of our little New York lessons. So go to your tree on the left and scroll down and you're gonna see the folder that says NY State by it, okay? All right. We're gonna do a little New York lesson here, okay? So click on NY201, that's the form for a New York State resident. We're gonna scroll down, you can see it's taking all the information right from the federal. It's got his name and his singles filing status. One question it asks, 
Do you have a financial account located in a foreign country? All right. Okay. Fred? Do you have a bank account in the Cayman Islands that I need to know about? I'll take that as a no. Okay. All right. I did have a client. I usually always ask that question when I'm, you know, kind of breaking the ice a little bit, saying, uh, do you have a foreign bank account such as, uh, you know, Switzerland or the Cayman Islands? And they say no. I had one client text me a picture of himself standing out front of a Cayman Island bank. <laughs> that was all he sent. And I just sent back, not funny, because that's a lot of paperwork. Okay. All right. So, and you can see everything on there. Let's go to New York, page two. All right. So, we can see up at the top there, a lot of lines look very familiar, don't they? They're all verbiage that we see on that 1040. In fact, to the point that line 19 says gross income, federal adjusted gross income. So New York uses everything right off the federal 1040. that flowed right over there for us, okay? As we can see, our interest income and our gambling winnings. All right, so has everybody got that on theirs? Okay, now, down below, okay, we have New York additions. Quick lesson on this, remember that 414H that I talked about? Okay, it's a 414H SUB. Do you know what the SUB stands for? Subtraction. Okay, but where is it at in the addition? It's so backwards, it's to the point that the software provider says, New York has requested a change to the codes for, uh, to be used on Form W-2 for 414-H. You must use 414-H SUV to indicate 414-H additions. Even the software knows that that's backwards, okay? But New York has requested that you do that. Okay, so when you read that line, you're going, okay, so SUB stands for subtractions, but we're adding it in, okay. so don't ask, all right? But what I want you to note, and again, when we do some more New York considerations, I'll kind of touch on these. For this one, I want you to note, if you go down to subtractions, what's it say on there? Interest income on U.S. government bonds. Subtractions, we don't have to pay tax in New York on that. What number shows up there for us? Everybody got a 541 there? That's because we put everything on a B and nothing on a B. Okay, because if we just typed in $541 on our Schedule B and didn't do it on a little worksheet, this wouldn't carry over. Okay, so does everybody have that there? Any knows? Okay. So you can see that we get to adjust our income by that. And a bunch of these other lines will come up as we go along. Obviously, New York's nice enough with the refund that we put on the federal. New York doesn't tax us twice on it. The federal government does. Surprising New York, right? But they don't tax us, but we do that, okay? All right. Okay. So you've just expanded your repertoire to W2Gs, gambling winnings, interest income, all right? Any questions? Well, we talked earlier about the 414. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Where it comes into play is, remember on the W2, when we do the W2? Oops, sorry, I gotta shrink it down again, apologies. Remember right here in box 14, okay? Box 14 here, usually it defaults, it has that 414H SUB in there, okay? What that 414H SUB is, it's um, state pensions, and they kind of act like Roths. So it's not taxable, it's not part of your taxable income on the federal, but you have to add it, and it's taxable on your state. Okay, so if I make, $20,000, $20,000 is taxable on the federal. If I make $20,000 and I'm putting in $1,000 into a 414H, 
I am now having $21,000 of taxable income show up on the state. So the state, that's the way they do it. And again, it's like a Roth for federal employees. It's tax going in, but it's tax free coming out. Okay. And when we do retirement, it'll make a little bit more sense when we look at the adjustments because of people that are over 59 and a half when we talk about retirement. Okay. All right. Any questions? Everybody's a pro now, right? Okay. So we have, yeah, we're good. We got about 15 minutes left. Okay. So let you do, you can do 4 2 for homework. Okay. Problem for 4 2. And then we'll do the quiz for chapter 4 next week and then uh, what I want you to do is make a note on the section in your book where it talks about home homework remember to follow the syllabus we're not going to chapter five okay all right again the book set up the way we did it so if somebody wanted to buy it and use it that's set up for the 1040 the way we're going to teach it to you we're going to do chapter 17 right so what the syllabus says Yes, so read an exercises in chapter 17. The reason we're doing that way, because next week we get to talk about the earned income credit, which is always a lot of fun. Okay? All right, any questions?